This week, I actually um, have the privilege to introduce Michael Healy. Uh, Michael is a brilliant mentor, friend, and I actually met with him in Venice at a global unconference. Uh, about 250 people were together and Michael and I met there. Michael is actually the CEO of Unit Ventures. He's thrived as an entrepreneur. Uh, he's actually been a self-taught web developer, a silver medal uh, mathematics Olympiad, and has worked for companies like Google, KPMG, Founders Forum, Saatchi and Saatchi, uh, and also at the London Business School and Unilever. So uh, while we're on here, if you'd like to send in your questions while, we're, while he's speaking, but with no further ado, Michael Healy, take the stage. Uh, thanks so much for having me, Lynn, and uh, super excited for this new upcoming uh, Unit Master session um, and the Unit Master's program. I think we're seeing some really interesting um, uh, developments with the digital asset and the token economy. And what we hope, I guess, with this Master's program and with the Unit Network and the Unit Platform and the ecosystem that we're building is to showcase how you know we're going to have a future where everyone is much more represented in this cooperative economy. So yeah, th thanks so much then and looking forward in this session to, to share more about what UNIT's about, what the master's program is about and what our, our vision is, our mission, what, what are the problems we're solving and yeah, how we see the, the future of the world with, with our collective work. So Michael, if you can, I'd, I'd like to ask a couple of questions. Um, we have a couple of questions from the group as well. Um, so we wanted to find out, um, I guess, what exactly is, if you could say the purpose of units specifically, what would that be? Definitely. So I guess, you know, part of the, the, the vision or, or the why for unit is, is to build this token driven economy. And I guess, you know, us as co-founders, we've kind of looked at the world and we've, we've noticed one of the big problems with the world is this huge income in, inequity or wealth, wealth gap. There's a, a small group of people who hold most of the resources in the world you know the founders and the investors of things and then there's the majority of society which is just getting a, a salary or a paycheck and you know just surviving and we want to create a world where the ownership of things are much more distributed amongst everyone in the economy and people have a a um an interest in other people's projects and other um other things they believe in so we imagine a future where you know if you walk down the street of any um, village or city and you talk to someone they'll, they'll have a portfolio of different tokens of like a local gym or a local supermarket or an artist friend or even a painting or a, a research project which they've either bought some you know it, when it got started or when it sort of started building or they uh, have done some work for and they've got a piece of so we're, we're sort of transitioning the economy to one where people are basically working and then getting paid and sort of working for the, for this um extremely valuable thing which only a small group of people own to one where people are making um generating most of their value um and 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 money from sort of supporting projects and then building things which everyone has a piece of so that's what we call the coll collaborative token economy and a unit makes it really easy to make a token to distribute it for the different people to see how many people hold the tokens to see, okay, um, what are the different tokens that I've supported? And we think that, you know, this is going to solve this huge um, wealth and equity, help value flow around the economy much more efficiently. And then it's it's going to yeah, solve a lot of other issues in the world, like, you know, for environmental to social issues, to um, people who, who want to be start a business as entrepreneurs, um, to people who have currently existing businesses and they want to scale up. They have tokens really change the world more than you know the way the internet gave access to information um, with something like google wikipedia and the way that the mobile phone has has really transformed the world of communication you know before if you wanted to talk to someone on the other side of the world you had to pay you know extremely high mobile fees um per, per minute and and you know now the cost of communicating or getting access to information is is yeah completely seamless for everyone in the world and we really think that um, the future of, you know, if you have an idea for a project and you just want to test it out and you need, say, you know, a small bit of money, like a few hundred dollars or a few thousand or a few hundred thousand dollars, the community would, you know, provide that seamlessly. You'll be able to test it out and everyone is, is motivated to help you succeed. It, it becomes from a much more separated society to one where everyone is, is really invested in supporting one another. Yeah. So I, I hope that kind of 
Let's use a question then. And one of the questions here from the group is, can you tell us exactly what a token is? Some people want a basic uh, description of that. Absolutely. So I guess you can think of a token as a really effective way of, of, um, of measuring and distributing value. So, you know, before, um, like before people used to start companies or organizations, and then they introduced the idea of shares. So a share is basically like a way of, you know, two people started a company, they'll have 50% of the company each and 50 shares. And then, um, yeah, these are the founders of the company. And maybe they took some investment and they sold some of the shares or they, they increased the number of shares and gave it to the investor for, for some money. And the founders, the investors, like get most of the value and tokens are basically saying, Hey, you know, it's, it's great having pieces of paper with share certificates and, you know, governments tracking like the share holdings, but how can we use technology to sort of make it better? So it's like, imagine if I was a newspaper company and you said, Hey, you know, instead of like having newspapers, which people read and a newspaper boy delivering it every morning, let's, let's put it on this thing called the internet, you know, and then, you know, many years later now, you know, news is much more accessible. People can, you know, set up their own news network. Um, same with the mobile phone, you know, people used to say, hey, you know, why don't you just use an app like WhatsApp or, or get a smartphone where you can, you know, share information and communicate seamlessly. So us at Unit, we basically said, hey, you know, this, this, um, these, these tokens are actually super interesting and valuable. They can be done for, you know, and like a wide range of, of purposes, uh, incredible amount of problems to be solved. And, and Unit basically powers powers tokens, like the token driven economy. So a token can be anything that you believe um, can be generates value or um, needs um, needs a tool for for um, needs a tool to be representative value. So like even a song, you know, you can make a token for that song, right? And all the people who who believed in that song early on can buy some of the tokens. And similar to you know, if if you um, listen to a track early on, you you could tell your friends, hey, you know, I, I I found this track before it was it was cool or before this artist was was uh, a, a household name and and tokens really allow for the the early um, listeners and the early super fans or if you think of Airbnb or Uber it's like a token for Uber would have been you know what the first Uber driver would have gotten or the first Airbnb host would have gotten so that some of the value of the eighty billion dollars that Uber went public for a hundred billion dollars that Airbnb went public for gets shared amongst the the, the users or the customers of the platform, or even Zoom, like we're using th this platform now, but none of the value created by the people hosting conferences and events went to the, the those people. It all went to the founders and the investors. So tokens allow for a really creative way to distribute the value there. Can you tell me a little bit more about, um, I guess, your goal in the master's program? It sounds like you've created this wonderful thing called master's program, if you can tell everyone what it's about a little bit. Absolutely. So um, like us as the unit team, we've, we've, we've been working extremely hard on, on building this program to teach people and to share people about this new token driven economy. We, we, we believe that even people in the crypto space, they, they could be big fans of Bitcoin or big fans of Ethereum, but they don't really see the potential for how powerful this new, um, new technology can be. And our, our goal is to really, um, give people the tools and, um, the case studies and, and the, the access to incredible speakers and uh, leaders in this industry to to kind of be creative and go like imagine if you know the internet was just starting and you know you had the opportunity to create something like Google or YouTube or or Facebook what could be done so in terms of like the token economy now there are maybe eight thousand tokens that exist but like in our opinion they're not as um, impactful uh, for the real world as they will be in the next ten years so part of this program is to sort of lay the foundation and uh, provide the, the tools and, and resources for people to create this new token-driven cooperative economy. And then what we plan to do after we've completed this unit masters, um, or not actually completed, but once we we've sort of have seen it thriving, we plan to sort of launch masters programs for different industries. So we, we, we're going to be launching an art masters program. We're going to be one doing a, a yoga masters program where we get people who are cutting edge leaders in these different industries to showcase like how, how have they become you know, who they are, like, what, what did they get started? What were their difficulties along the way? And um, yeah, give people a, a network and a resource for them to really thrive in that industry. You've mentioned a couple of times about unconferences. Can you talk to the group about what that is and uh, the purpose of that? Definitely. So I guess we think of unconferences as, as a way to showcase um, 
showcase uh, people who are doing cutting edge work. Like we, we call them unconferences or unit conferences where we might have maybe five or, or seven or, or two or three or, or 10 speak, uh, speakers running at the same time where it's like um, a really good opportunity for people to kind of facilitate discussion or debate or sort of uh, meet, meet and learn what other people are working on. We've held over 2000 uh, unit conference sessions and given the opportunity for people to, to share what, about what they're passionate about, what they're working on, how to team up and collaborate. And, you know, a countless number of people within the unit community and network have, you know, ended up working on projects together, supported one another, invested in, in projects. And what we hope is that this really serves as a good foundation along with the master's program for building up this token driven economy. And, and you know, like I, I remember I was extremely lucky uh, to attend a few conferences when I first moved to London. And it, it was it really served as a catalyst. It kind of opened, opened um, the, the doors and opportunities for myself to, um, yeah, some really exceptional people. So I guess part of our goal is is to kind of um, provide that to our community and and our team is, is super passionate because of how much it's helped them. And we, we believe that this is a gift that we can provide to the world. Like we imagine, you know, anyone going to any um, city or, or town across the world and there will be a unit um, conference and a unit community that they can really tap into and engage with and, and thrive uh, together with. And can you tell us as far as uh, why we're on the Polkadot blockchain? Absolutely. So, you know, Bitcoin was this super interesting thing where um, it was the first um, software or the first tool where you could transfer value between two parties and neither party had to trust one another. So it was like, hey, you know, I, I, I'm going to send you a payment, um, but we don't need to trust. I, I don't need to trust you. You don't need to trust me. We don't need to trust a third party like PayPal or a bank and we can do payment securely. And then Ethereum kind of looked at Bitcoin and said, hey, you know, this is really cool. Like we, we can build a payment network which doesn't trust um, a, a third party. You know, it doesn't like there's no central party which is being trusted. Um, let's um, let's build applications on it. Like let's build something like Facebook where we didn't have to trust, you know, a corporation or let's build um, something like Uber where we don't have to trust this company in San Francisco. Let, let's build um, yeah, using smart contracts, these applications. And then um, one big problem was it didn't scale. You know, too many people are trying to build on this one blockchain, Ethereum. And Polkadot has basically uh, looked at Ethereum and says, okay, like we, we created Ethereum. We made a bunch of mistakes. Let's, let's do better. So Polkadot is basically thinking about how can we do the blockchain of blockchains. And, and the unit network, the unit uh, blockchain is one of those blockchains that's sitting on the Polkadot network. And it, it promises to connect um, all the different blockchains together. So if, if someone wanted to send something on, on the Ethereum network to the unit blockchain, it does that through Polkadot. So we believe that this is going to be the building blocks of the future uh, distributed internet. And, and we, we're excited to really be a leader and pioneer there. Well, I know that there's a bunch of uh, questions now. I, can you see the questions there? That the Absolutely. So we have a uh, uh, a great question from Mario Ben. What makes a token different to a traditional currency? That, that's a great point. So um, traditional currency, if you think about things like the US dollar, the euro, the Japanese yen, the Taiba, these are things that you know governments issue and they, they, they try and provide a safe environment for people in this economy, this geographic region to buy and sell products with. It, it's, it maintains some level of stability within that geography and they prevent people from like uh, making like forged papers, like printing out bank notes. They, they kind of make sure that, you know, um, we can collect, like people, governments can collect taxes to pay for public infrastructure and, and, and sort of create this economic environment, which is, which is reliable, sound, trustworthy. And, and that's like traditional currency and digital tokens or digital currencies basically say, how can we do that? But instead of depending on a central government, which hopefully doesn't print out too much money and make our, you know, savings or our current money worth less, um, how can we uh, do in a transparent way so that, you know, governments, like we, we're not trusting them to sort of allocate our money to public goods, to schools, to hospitals in a fair way. How can we do it, it uh, using technology on a digital network where everyone can see, okay, how much is held by different people? Where is it flowing? Like th these are things that are different by tokens. You can think of a digital, a digital currency as a token too. So a lot of uh, countries are mo creating central bank digital currencies and these are, are also tokens. I guess one difference is that with central bank digital currencies, um, usually there isn't a limited supply. So it's like, you know, um, they're, they're, they're able to sort of create more 
uh, digital currency for that country or, or reduce it or kind of ensure that there's inflation uh, in a manageable way over time. And, and digital tokens like cryptocurrencies sometimes have a finite supply or they, they have a more, um, more reliable way of, of introducing new currency. So Bitcoin started with issuing 50 Bitcoin every, every block in, in 2009. And every four years, it's split by um, half. So it was 50 Bitcoin, then it was 25 Bitcoin, the, the, the amount being released. And it's 12 and a half Bitcoin. And, and that's kind of what the, the, the rules for the Bitcoin now with unit, you know, we have hundred million unit that, that has been issued. And then over time as it's used, it gets reduced. So this is like an example of deflationary economy. Um, and yeah, we're, we're super excited because we believe that part of our, our hard work with unit is going to pave a way for a more just and, and fair world. And we believe that we, we can sort of build the building blocks for, we have a really good question here from, um, Miyaraki. Uh, Santima, uh, quick question. So who decides the value of a token? So um, Alex answered here later, the value of a token is decided by the market. If the project has value, people will pay money for it. So that's a, that's a really good reply. He's referring to the speculative value of a token. So, you know, if people believe that a token's worth more, it sort of becomes worth more, the price increases. And this has led to, you know, bubbles, you know, where, you know, people believe something to be worth a lot and they, they buy, buy a lot of it and the value kind of skyrockets. Um, but then the big problem is if there's no underlying value as to what people are buying, then it could crash. So like, there's this thing called a pump and a dump where people basically buy a token or buy a stock and it basically pumps up in value. And then, you know, all of a sudden people start selling and it crashes because there's nothing uh, warranting or backing the underlying value of, of this share or token or, or asset. And we basically looked at this and we said, okay, how can we prevent uh, this sort of scenario? How can we prevent, you know, people who believe in, in something investing in it and then go um, wake up tomorrow morning and find out, oh, oh my goodness, you know, my 80% of my value has dropped because as Alex was saying, the value of the token decided by the market has dropped. Like uh, people are selling it and the price drops. How, how do we prevent this? So with, with unit, we, we've kind of uh, introduced this feature called the treasury. And this provides a similar way to which companies are valued. We have a, a, a pool of digital tokens which we believe should represent the value of every single token so that, you know, when people look at a token, they can see, okay, how much value is backing up this token? Like what is in the piggy bank? What is in the treasury that is giving this token value? And similar to a business, you know, you, you, you look at a business and you go, okay, how much cash does the business have and how profitable is it in filling up this, this, um, this reserve of, of, of cash or value. And that kind of gives it an indication of where it's going. So if you look at Apple, you know, I, Apple has, like $190 billion of cash um, that they've generated in profit. And then p investors are basically, uh, when they buy the stock, they're paying for that cash that's sitting there and they're paying for the profit that the business makes over time. So we've kind of looked at that and, and, and kind of looked at, you know, the crypto world and said, you know, people have said that, you know, cryptocurrencies, don't, they don't need to be backed by anything. They can be entirely speculatively driven. And then we, we went and said, okay, hey, internet companies, that's what they used to say too. You know, internet companies, they, they, you just needed eyeballs. You don't need a business model. You don't need fundamentals. And we said, okay, how can we build this new token-driven economy, but with fundamentals where, you know, if, if you started a restaurant and, I, and you said, um, hey, Michael, like, please invest in my restaurant token. I could go and say, okay, is, is your restaurant like burning through so much money that there's a risk that your restaurant could go bankrupt? Like, is it a badly run project? Um, or is it, you know, economically sound where, you know, it's covering costs and it generates a bit of value uh, at the end of the month or, you know, while it's running, that it can put some of this funds into a treasury which backs up the token. So we, we expect all of this to be done, you know, in an extremely transparent way. If you look at uh, Germany, you know, one of the most um, like cutting edge um, and, and also by the books countries in the world, there was a company called Wirecard and it was like the poster child of, of, of German tech and it was valued at $30 billion. And, and then all of a sudden overnight, it was discovered that they had invented $2 billion. They asked um, um, Pr Price Waterhouse to, to sign off saying, hey, we've got $2 billion of cash. And, and yeah, it didn't exist because all they did was they put Photoshop of their bank balance. They gave it to the auditors. The auditors signed it. Everyone believes the auditors because, you know, they're, they're auditors. They're not supposed to mess up. But then, you know, it got revealed that it was fraud. And then, you know, it was a huge disgrace for, for Germany and for, you know, like investors. And the nice thing about this token-driven economy, the blockchain, is that 
you know, there is no need to trust auditors. There's no need to trust banks to kind of underwrite things. You, you can just see it on the blockchain and th there's no possibility to, to lie. It's just, it's just there. And, you know, a really nice quote, which um, people share in this industry is um, Google's motto is uh, don't be evil. You know, so everyone was like, hey, let's use Google because, you know, it says don't be evil. Every action they do, they're going to kind of say, okay, th this is a good thing. We're not going to do something bad. And um, in, in, in eventually they ended up, you know, um, uh, tra tracking people, selling the data to advertisers, um, doing some things which are maybe borderline a bit illegal, uh, not evil, not, not necessarily illegal, but um, the, the motto of the blockchain is you can't be evil. So it's, you know, written in the protocol that the rules and, and what's being done with the data. And, you know, it's not possible for a single party to go, okay, now we've got everyone on board. Let's start taking advantage of this network and charging them to generate profit. So yeah, th these are, I guess, a few points. Yeah. We have a, a question here from Max. How can the token economy be implemented in our fiat-based economy? Isn't it necessary that the entire ecosystem um, is based on tokens or cryptocurrencies for this to work? So that's a really great question. So like, how does this token economy sort of interact with the the, the normal day-to-day uh, -day economy and, and how can it kind of interact with one another and fit with one another? Well, the same with the internet. You know, if, if you watch early interviews of, of of Amazon, Jeff Bezos, and he kind of explains that, you know, internet companies are going to disrupt retail. You know, it might sound crazy to use your credit card to buy something online or, you know, to think that retail stores are going to go out of business. But he, he felt that, you know, over time, you know, more people are going to buy stuff online and retail commerce is going to disappear. So it's not going to be an overnight thing, you know, similar to the internet. People aren't going to go, uh, let's entirely stop retail shopping and let's buy stuff online. But it's going to be like a, a, a natural transition. So that kind of took 20 years uh, from when e-commerce uh, shops like eBay or platforms like Amazon started in, in the early 90s to 2021 now where, you know, the biggest company in the world is an e-commerce store and most of the biggest projects in the world are e uh, internet platforms. So now, now we're really at the beginning, you know, the entire uh, market cap or the entire valuation for this token economy is 1.5 trillion. I, I'm, I'm extremely confident that in the next five to 10 to 15 years, this is going to go to 100 trillion and it's going to completely um, evolve the entire economy to one where, you know, corporations and, and banks are not going to sort of um, be trusted or depended on. It's just going to be using technology and, and customers and, and people are going to be able to hold their value and, and invest in things that they believe in um, w without these, these middlemen. And how does this happen? So it starts off with projects like Unit Emerging, providing the, this really robust and reliable and trustworthy infrastructure that people build projects and, and applications or small businesses or build their community tokens on. And then, you know, people can see, oh my gosh, this, these uh, cooperatively owned organizations and, um, and, and token driven um, projects that are much more successful than the old model. And then we'll start to see a natural transition. I actually think this is going to be a faster transition than, you know, the internet or the mobile phone because um, tokens are built on these two. And, you know, with, with the internet, you know, you need it to pay for broadband, you need it to pay for internet service providers to lay the, the cables, you know, or, or else like it'll be too slow to watch a video or, or to store stuff. With, um, with um, the, the, the mobile phone, everyone needed to have a smartphone. Like if, you, if you're the only one with a smartphone and you try to use an app, there won't be many other people on it and people have to buy this expensive piece of hardware. The cool thing about tokens is you, people just need to download a wallet and with a protocol or a platform like a unit and Polkadot, you know, it really handles much of the, the heavy lifting and the scalability side. And yeah, I, I think it's going to be much faster. Um, do we have a question. Yep. Uh, please. Oh, I just wanted to say, um, how do you feel as though with diversity and inclusion and women owned businesses, um, how do you think that, you know, this collaboration economy is going to affect unit and what do you think unit can do for it? Absolutely. So if you look at, you know, how companies are financed or fundraised at the moment, you know, like you mentioned, a very small minority of society really reaps the rewards. You know, if, if you're uh, Caucasian, if you're uh, male, if you're um, under a certain, like within a certain age range, if you're if you're you're too young or you're too old, it's 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 much more tricky to to fundraise because you kind of don't fit into this picture of of what uh, society thinks is going to be a likely successful investment, and. Um, what tokens really democratize is this access to financing. You know, the same way um, before, you know, it used to be tough to uh, publish 
um, or access information. You know, the same way it used to be tough to communicate with people, you know, before the smartphone. Now it is generally very tough to raise money for a project. You know, if you don't have a track record, if you don't have a network, if if you're born in a small village, like it's really tough to 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 get even a small amount of resources to finance your education or to start a small project. And you, you might not even need that much money. You might just need you know a few hundred dollars to 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 buy some some land or to buy some seeds to to build a farm. But the way the economy is set up is it's just not possible. It's very very difficult to 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 easily supply resources to places like that and and for, for these organizations to operate in a trustless way. So um, I, I strongly believe that th this token infrastructure blockchains are going to really solve the access um, to resources for these minority groups. And, and really level the playing field. Like people won't need to go to a place like Silicon Valley or San Francisco or uh, London or Hong Kong or Singapore to, to raise money. Even if you're in a small village like, or, or developing nation, you know, you can, you're on the same playing field as everyone else. And if you're able to run a, a successful operation from wherever you are, you, you, people around the world will see that and they'll be like, okay, this is someone who, who is hardworking, is trustworthy and reliable. Like I, I love to support them, and and then you know people really are are much more one and, and connected that way. Some other questions there from the group. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, we have a question here from uh, Im Imalian. Do you intend to develop the token economy only on Polkadot, or you could support tokens on other protocols or blockchains? That, that's a great question. So you know, there's so many different blockchains which are emerging, and like, how do you decide? which one to build on, or is this one that's going to be around for a while or will it disappear? Um, the cool thing about Polkadot is it realizes that there isn't going to be one blockchain or five blockchains. It kind of says, you know, there's going to be hundreds of blockchains and they're going to be specifically tailored for a particular application. And and Unit is, is building on Polkadot because we, we share the same vision where, you know, if someone wants to issue a token on Unit, through the Polkadot network, you know, it's, it's, um, it supports tokens on Ethereum or it supports tokens on say, um, like um, the Bitcoin side chains or uh, yeah, there's, there's many different platforms for issuing tokens. And the cool thing about Unit and Polkadot is, is we, we, we realize this and we want it all to be connected. We think like, you know, if, 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 if we're thinking about email, if, if, um, if you set up like a Gmail and I set up a Hotmail and it wasn't possible for us to email one another, you know, you would have to only set up e like an email address with that same uh, domain. Like, you, like imagine if, if it was a case where only Gmail accounts could email Gmail or only Yahoo accounts could email Yahoo or Hotmail to Hotmail. Like it would be very difficult. So Polkadot sort of bridges these different blockchains together in, in a trustless way and supports this, um, this uh, interoperability. So, you know, to em Emilian's question um, on how we support tokens or other protocols or blockchains, it allows it all to be super seamless and together. And hopefully for the end user, they don't even know they're using a blockchain. Like it's just so easy and, and seamless. And then if anyone wants to, as Alex has mentioned, don't trust verify, it would be easy for them to do that. Yep, uh, we have a question here also from Milian. Do you, have, do you have in mind specific use cases and industries for the token economy? Yep, that's a great idea. Um, great question. So I'll give like one specific, or three, three examples. So one project that we're developing here in Bali is a village. Uh, we're, we're building like a, um, a cool living community for, for our team and for people who are passionate about the digital economy and, and the cooperative um, world that we're moving towards. And we have a village token, which represents value in this, um, this, this community and, and the infrastructure being built. So that's like one example, you know, instead of uh, building a co-living space or a hotel, you could issue a token for it, and it won't just be five people that benefit from that project is being successful. It's you know all the people living there, so it won't be like the landlord and then the the tenants. It will be like everyone is a landlord. There's going to be like people who have a bigger part of the pie, um, but everyone else has a piece of that. So when a project becomes successful, that that really benefits. Another one is where we're we're developing a bioluminescent plant, so like a plant that glows in the dark. Um, and we're excited to use a, a glow token for that. So instead of it being set up as a traditional business where, you know, so if it was a startup where, you know, it'd be a number of co-founders launching it, it would raise some outside money and it would grow. And then, you know, the, the founders of it, the investors of it will benefit. We're showing how, you know, an example of, of this uh, plant, glowing plant um, business um, or project can be more successful when done with a token, more transparent 
uh, people don't have to wait for it to be acquired or go public. It's completely open. And another one is we're building um, like a panel project. So we, we with well with with the with the bioluminescent plant project, we want to show how genetic engineering isn't something super scary and it, it can be done in a, a super a seamless way and then with the with the panel project the third example which we we want to solve the homelessness in the world so like buying a home uh, rent is is a big part of, of usually someone's uh, income and, and value and we basically want to um create a world where you know social housing is much more affordable and people have the the access to um affordable affordable homes so yeah uh, those are three examples and then you know within unit we have the unit token we're also building a number of industry tokens where we are based, similar to you know fund is, is support a particular industry. We believe that tokens are going to support our industry. Tokens are going to support this industry globally, and people can feel that they're part of a, a global network which they have a piece of. And then we're doing the same for city tokens, so that um, people have the opportunity to uh, invest in a local city and um, benefit from the the network effects within the city for digital assets excited to go uh, share that. And this is something that we're developing as we speak and over the next two or three years, we hope to be like a leader in the blockchain space using like this very unique uh, approach of, of um, yeah, bringing this global. Any more questions? Uh, yes, definitely. So we have, uh, we have a question here from, um, from Sven. Hi, Michael. Is there a fixed amount of polka dots like Bitcoin and are these mined or created at the start of the blockchain? That's a great question. So um, what Sven is referring to is um, tokens with a limited supply or tokens with an unlimited supply. So in the case of polka dot, um, there is a, um, a, a polka dot similar to Bitcoin has planned to have a, a um, does increase its number of tokens or they call it dot token. So with Bitcoin, it's BTC, it's Bitcoin. With Polkadot, they call it dot. With, with Ethereum, it's called ETH. Uh, so with Polkadot, um, there are tokens being issued um, um, to, um, over time um, and, and these are being mined and that's done when people stake the tokens. Um, so when, when people create a token driven project, they kind of decide um, do I want it to have an unlimited supply or, or do I want it to have a limited supply? And the reason why unit, for instance, has a limited supply is because we have the belief that, you know, a deflationary economy is one that will thrive uh, because it doesn't force people to, to spend money or to um, invest money if they don't want to. So we believe that, you know, contrary to a lot of like Austrian economics, um, um, beliefs where you know inflation is necessary because if not for inflation people won't spend money people won't invest money um, we believe that you know inflation actually causes people to buy things or spend in things which they don't want or don't need and it would be better if they you know spent or invested in things which they needed rather than just throwing money around and expecting um yeah expecting that um that that this is going to solve a lot of problems like yeah we're excited that this um, the fact that unit only has 100 million tokens and over time actually reduces in supply is is actually a more beneficial and and we, we actually think that this is going to completely change the economy um yeah and, and the token economy where where things don't where people don't get diluted over time so if you know if, if i was making minimum wage and i was getting like a small sort of pay rise every month um thanks to um a deflationary economy without uh, me getting a salary increase, I'm sort of making more over time. And, and we think that you know, th this can really help people who have saved and uh, cho chosen not to spend um, yeah. and, and protect the value of the underlying assets. Okay, we have a question from Miguel. If I understood well, you build an asset backed token, which is key, very nice, but isn't the treasury a centralized instance? Haven't you thought about decentralizing it? Do you have any ideas about how to do it? Great, great point, Miguel. So the cool thing about the treasury built on the unit network and every single token has a treasury is that it isn't a, it isn't centralized it's it's all, all the value is held on the blockchain and the only people that can take money from the treasury are the token holders so like let's say if you made a miguel token and you issued 100 tokens and there was $100 in the treasury if i held 10 10 miguel tokens i could basically go to the treasury and take $10 back 
So if, if let's say you wanted to be a musician and I was like, okay, Miguel, I believe, I believe in you. I'm going to give you some money to sort of kick off your music career. And, um, you know, you put some of that, your profits into a treasury. At least I know if you disappear, if uh, you spend the money in, in your bank and, you know, I can't contact you, I, in the worst case scenario, I can still go to the treasury and that sets the lowest price or the underlying value of, of the token. So we think this is a, a key innovation, which, yeah, we haven't found anyone in the crypto or token or blockchain space who has done it. And yeah, we, we believe that this is going to revolutionize like the entire space. Um, we have a, a question. Um, question here. Um, in what way is this treasury concept an innovation to the current crypto project, or even more general society? What's the benefit of it? So the benefit of it is that it basically, um, it basically provides a way for, um, for tokens to be, um, for, for, invest, for, for buyers of a token to not have to worry about um, what's the worst case scenario in, in the case of them losing out. So um, the really nice thing about, um, the really nice thing about a treasury is it really protects the, um, the, the buyers of the token because you know people buy Bitcoin now they buy Ethereum they buy Polkadot tokens and they have no clue like um, what this like what what they're getting into you know if if let's say someone puts their life savings into Bitcoin they're like you know I'm going for it um, they they have no clue like if they wake up tomorrow like how how low can this price go like Bitcoin dropped ten percent since like yesterday twenty four hours ago and. And a lot of people are just kind of like, okay, I, I have put this in, I, I, like I'm in for a ride, like let's see what happens. And we believe that, you know, our treasury feature in it, within unit, it provides a level of uh, consistency and um, a, a sort of safety net um, for the, the token buyers, for the founders. And it, it also uh, um, solves the, the point earlier that was mentioned, like people say, what is a token worth? It's just uh, worth what people are buying at. So if, if you just tell a bunch of friends, hey, buy my token, buy my token, buy my token, then, you know, you don't have to care about building a, a sustainable project. You don't have to care about delivering any services or products before. You can just tell people to buy your token. But then the issue is that it becomes like a Ponzi scheme. You know, it's like, you know, you just buy this token, it's going to keep rising in value. And if you can't get people to keep buying your token, then it's, it's going to drop, right, when people start selling. So we've basically looked at that and went, you know, people used to say with internet companies, you know, you don't have to build a, a real sustainable project. You just need eyeballs um, and people said that with apps, you know, apps, you, you, you don't need a business model. You just need users. And, and we basically all, like people didn't know, how do you make money from apps? Like Instagram, people were like, oh my gosh, you bought a photo sharing app for a billion dollars. How do you generate a return? And now Instagram's like a $70 billion business. So we've basically taken this sort of learnings and applied it to the token space and, and gone, okay, like with, with these fundamental measures and if um, a, a token buyer or an investor can kind of look at a token and go, okay, you know, this doesn't make sense because there's nothing backing up the token. If I am buying this token, I know that in the worst case scenario, it can drop like 100%. So it, it, it just provides a framework. And then we, we for instance, have a, a, token trust, a token trust framework so that people can see, okay, if um, this token is valued at say uh, $10,000 and it has uh, $9,500 in its treasury, then it's a pretty safe token. It's like in the worst case scenario, you know, there's 900, $9,500 in the treasury to back up and, and pay everyone if everyone asks for their money back. And the problem with much of the token space at the moment is if everyone asks for their money back tomorrow, the markets will just crash. So we, we want to move this, the token economy from where it is now to one where it's you know backed by underlying value and, and people can transparently see what's worth. But th this is also a point of view, which you know many people in the crypto space, they don't see um, they, they don't really understand yet. So I think this is one, one area where we really stand out and we're excited to sort of showcase and the future. Michael, I think we only have about five minutes left. And I just wanted to say, you know, I think one of the reasons I've joined UNIT specifically is because of the amazing people and the amazing board of directors and the joint venture people and the people that you've attracted to this. Um, I think it would be interesting to kind of to close out with that in the next five minutes. Like, how have you been able to build this network yourself and attract these amazing people to this amazing adventure thanks so much um yeah so in terms of unit like we're, we're super grateful and fortunate to have like um um extremely ta uh, extremely talented co-founders and advisors like people who've um led political changes people who've built billion dollar businesses people who've done like built major communities and uh pioneered like scientific research so we've, we've curated this extremely 
a broad uh, across different industry network and, and global in terms of different cities. And we're working hard on, on teaming up with them to, to, to build towards this new economy. And, and we're really excited for it because it's really just at the beginning and the crisp. And we really think that we're in a good position to sort of accelerate it. We have a question here from Philip. What's the mo what is the compelling argument for startup founders to use tokens rather than centralized ledger economy? As things stand, founders perceive that they stand to get rich. How can they believe tokens will protect their gains? Absolutely. So, you know, um, the, the way that we've kind of looked at tokens is in this new model, you know, the rich aren't necessarily losing out to everyone else. The rich will get richer, you know, the, because the pie is getting bigger. But instead of them holding 100% of the pie, the pie gets shared and distributed with other people. So like why a startup founder would use a token rather than, you know, equity or have a token um, sort of um, sitting on top of different companies uh, which represent equity is because they think that, you know, this is going to help them uh, fundraise better. Uh, this is going to help them get um, customers, get clients. That the network effects of starting is, is not easy. So this kind of helps them. It makes everyone basically an owner and, and motivate to help it succeed. And then number three, it helps with payments and scaling it globally. And yeah, financially, they'll also benefit because they don't have to wait to get acquired or, or go on the stock exchange. In real time, they kind of know what it's worth and, and they don't have to say, okay, I'm going to work really hard for 10 years. Um, and then hopefully, you know, a big company buys me over and then I'm going to retire or something like this. It becomes, entrepreneurship becomes much less risky. It's not like you either become a huge success or you fail. It's like, you know, you can be a huge success. Um, you can kind of like build the project over time. So it really gives an opportunity for everyone to be an entrepreneur. And it won't be such a lonely thing because, you know, everyone is able to support in, in this project and they really care because they have a, a vested stake in it succeeding. We're going to be doing some, I guess, breakout rooms and uh, following up. But thank you so much for taking the time out to do this and really explain it and uh, talk about this exciting adventure. Thank you, everybody, for being here. This has been amazing, amazing, amazing. So thank you very much. And so I think now we're going to go into some breakout rooms where we can all network.